Well, hello, everybody in YouTube world. Hi, it's the weekly, whoops, financial thing, Hang on. <clears throat> live stream coming to you today from my very sparse office in Orlando, Florida, still here. But uh, hope you everybody, hope everybody is well. I've got the tea today for the first time. You usually won't see me drinking out of a tea, but I've got the uh, the green tea matcha powder. It's doing a little body cleanse. And uh, as you see, I got a little bit of a different look. So, But it's still me and uh, still here to bring you the week's news with peer-to-peer -peer lending, general investing topics. You can talk about whatever you want. Put it in the chat. As always, we'll go through and answer all the questions uh, if you have any. It's been an interesting week in the peer-to-peer -peer lending world, as always. And uh, got some news, some, some obviously coverage with rate setters, proposed sale to Metro Bank. And I'm going to be talking about assets capital this week, a bit of property partner, some landing works, prop land, what else? Loan pad update. A little bit about Mr. Neil Woodford. And uh, then I'm going to be telling you about my uh, top five biggest regrets in alternative finance investing, what I wish I could do differently if I had the chance to rewind time. Uh, last week, we kind of went through the top five of the, on my top five list and the pros and cons for why those uh, companies are on my top five list. So you know, kind of do the top five regrets if we have time. You can put your bets in for us going over or under an hour this week. I would say probably 100 to one under an hour. So it's a pretty good, pretty good bet if you wanted to take that bet. Uh, but I don't think we're going to get under an hour this week. So as always, hi, everybody. I, I seem to have an itchy nose today. I don't know why. Always when I get on the stream, I have an itchy nose. But And first in the comments today is, of course, Chica Boy. Um, I think that's the first time that you've ever been first in the comments. So uh, I'm impressed this week, Chica Boy. Thank you, everybody, for hitting that thumbs up button. I appreciate that. And subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. We do this live stream every Thursday evening, 7.30 p.m. Uh, so let's get right to it this week. Um, I will acknowledge everybody. Of course, Martin is here. Arthur Hatchison, Colin Perry in the Peak District. Paul from Manchester. Chicka Boy, of course, some folks and Paul. In sunny Barmouth in Wales on holiday. Okay, there you go. Martin, who are you? Where is Lawrence? Yes, I'm here. I actually decided to shave this week um, in an effort probably fruitlessly to look a, a little bit younger. So who knows? Uh, Paul, thank you for the nice comments on the hair. I actually have not cut my hair. I just decided to brush it today. So first time. Thank you. And Chica Boy, thank you for the nice compliment. Andy, thank you too. John Day in Nottingham, as always. Brian in Woburn. And Mike. <laughs> yes, it's uh, the wind has blown all of my beard off today. It's weird. I actually had a whole rack of razor blades, and I thought well, maybe I better start using them because they were getting a little bit old. And uh, who else have we got? Aki Chap, of course, in Accrington. Annabelle from Dinea. Dinea. Hola, como estas, Annabelle? Uh, como tu sientes? And who else? Yes, ES in Portugal, of course. Kind of flow. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hit that thumbs up button if you can for me. Don't forget to join the Funding Secure and Lendy Action Group. Uh, groups. That was my bottle of water, not a gunshot. So, of course, Facebook groups for the action groups. As you know, I put those links up every week. I'm going to go ahead and do that because I always do. And, of course, we have Mark Mason usually here from the Funding Secure Action Group and Mr. Mike Powell, who does incredible work on behalf of investors uh, for the Lendy Action Group. 
both of those people. So go ahead and join up. And if you haven't already, come and hop in the financial thing, Facebook group. We have a lot of fun there. Talk about lending. So <clears throat> what do we got this week? We have today, of course, the big news this week, the Metro Bank finally decided they were going to have an intention to buy rate setter. Um, I, I was expecting that that deal was going to take longer to be announced, and it is under the provision of a, a regulatory approval of that deal, which I expect they would get. Uh, let's see here. So sale price of up to 12.5 million pounds. What that means is they're going to get an initial payment of two and a half million pounds and then additional 500,000 pounds will go to rate setter in consideration over the next 12 months. Don't really know what that means, what consideration means, but it's probably something written in the contract. And then year three of completion up to 9 million pounds, depending on uh, rate setter's performance. So rate setter will, sorry, Metro will use its uh, customer's deposit base to fund new unsecured loans. I was kind of surprised about that. Um, I mean, I figured, of course, that there would be some liquid input of money from Metro Bank, but, uh, you know, banks usually tend to be a little bit cautious when they invest money, and they must have uh, faith in rate setters' ability to underwrite unsecured peer-to-peer -peer loans. Um, so, yeah, I was a little bit surprised that that. And what it, what it sounds to me is that rate setter will become more of an institutional lending company is obviously Metro Bank being a, an institutional lending company. But Race Center is going to continue to operate independently from Metro Bank, even though the land, loans will be branded as both Met, Race Center and Metro Bank loans. Uh, the deal does not include Race Center Australia, which is probably a little bit pissed off right now because um, Race Center Australia is about to launch an IPO stock market float. And technically on paper, Race Setter will have been sold for a lot lower than the valuation that Race Setter probably wanted to receive, which then has a knock on effect on Race Setter Australia's launch price for their IPO. Even though the companies say that they operate completely independently, I bet Race Setter Australia is a little bit pissed off at the moment. Um, everything is crackling and barking today. That was the dog. So, what else? We have, um, so if you look at Race Setter and their previous equity funding rounds, they've raised over 50 million pounds. And if you look at the sale price based on 12 and a half million, the people that have put money into Race Setter through equity funding are probably also a little bit annoyed that the company was sold for such a low price. And that does bring on the question is, you know, was Race Setter actually to the point where they really had to get a deal done? Um, because of what was going on with COVID. Maybe their business is, is declining, which would make sense. I mean, in the unsecured business world, we've seen it this week with announcements from the Lending Club about that's the American version of an unsecured lender and how much their lending has dropped over the last um, quarter compared to the quarter of 2019. You would think that the same knock-on effect is going to happen to rate setter, and I think we'd be a little bit naive to think that unsecured loans are not going to take a beating over the next few months. So yeah, the valuation is pretty low. Um, you know, and this is another reason why I really don't think it's a good idea to be buying shares through companies like Cedars because um, you could put in money into these companies and then the valuations are just so speculative. There's you know, if you, you, you think about Race Center that was making a loss most of their business operating years and, and, and you know, the valuation probably is about accurate to the amount of money that they are expected to make. So hence a very low valuation on Race Center. And if you think about uh, over the next three years, they don't perform well, then that question of the extra 9 million pounds that Metro Bank will give to the race setter sale may be in question. Uh, so in a, a very worst case scenario, race setter could have been sold for um, this two and a half million pounds initial price plus another 500K in considerations. 
Uh, it doesn't really give Race Setter a very good valuation as a company, but you know, valuations are based usually on profit and loss, and a lot of these alt fi companies have been operating at a loss for a while, so they just don't have great valuations. Um, so pulling out my crystal ball, people have been asking me this week what I think is going to happen to, to rate sets. So I have the crystal ball as always, and it's just purely my opinions, but I expect the rate setters lending interest rates that they're giving to investors are going to remain very low until the end of 2020. I don't expect them to change at all as they try to replenish this provision fund. And I also expect that um, if I had to take a guess, I think rate setter will just end up exiting out of retail peer-to-peer -peer lending the same way that some of the other peer-to-peer -peer companies have done, like Lambay. Uh, we've seen uh, lending crowd do it. We've seen we're seeing probably funding circle do it. Um, if you have this huge pool of institutional money that you can lend out, then you don't need peer to peer lending anymore. Um, to obviously struggle for race set and make a profit using a peer to peer business model, so I I wouldn't be surprised if they completely phase out uh, peer to peer lending within. You know, I don't know how long it will take them to do that, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. Again, just my opinion. We'll see if those come true. So that's the that's the race set of news. Um, what do we have? So this week, sort of lending club is the American version of race sets to some degree. Uh, they do a lot of unsecured lending. They have a very big present very, very big lending pools of money. And what they announced over the last month is that their quarter two originations were 2.38 billion in 2019. That's uh, 2.38 billion pounds. And in 2020, that dropped all the way to just 248 million pounds. So you can see that's a that's about a ninety percent drop in loan originations on unsecured lending uh, in the U.S. and I think you're really going to see that also happen to some degree in the U.K. We just don't know to what level that you'll see that drop. I don't think you'll know for a while. But Lending Club, yeah, seeing some big drop offs on their lending that announced. Uh, Let's have a look. We're seeing um, also Lending Works is saying that their average returns for 2020 loans, which I spelled completely wrong, L A O N S, is going to be expected to drop from 4.8% to 4.2% in the growth account and down from 3.4% targeted to 3% in the flexible account. And expected annual losses will go from 3.5% up to 3.8%. Personally, I think that's very conservative. Um, yeah, I think you're going to see those, those expected annual losses increase as time goes on. And they say only 6% of their loan book has received payment deferrals. Um, I don't think we're going to know this real impact of lending works business until probably the end of 2020. And one thing that did concern me about What's going on with LendingWorks is their uh, provision fund shield cash balance fell to only 520,000 pounds in quarter two. And that fell from 920,000 pounds in quarter one. So you can see 400,000 came out of the provision shield over those uh, that one quarter. Uh, that, that's definitely concerning, especially since LendingWorks is not paying out investors any interest at the moment. Uh, everything is supposed to be going into the Shield Fund, so uh, I think we'll probably wait and see till quarter three and see how you know that Shield cash balance gets replenished. Which I would see it. I would hope to see a significant bump, uh, especially you know as a lender, I'm not getting any interest. I want to know that that money's being diverted into the place it's supposed to be diverted to uh yeah so what's going on this week with loan pad you know i always do a, a weekly 
Lone Pad update because I'm I'm a fan of Lone Pad at the moment. I think they're doing the right thing during this COVID situation. We saw a bump in the loan total loan value this week from 32.7 million up to 38.4 million. And now Lone Pad's loan book is just shy of 11 million pounds. And um, 10 million pound loan book is sort of the sweet spot in peer to peer lending where it's generally thought that a company can make a profit when they have a loan book of 10 million pounds. So it's good to see uh, Lone Pad get over that 10 million pound mark. They still have a very average, low average loan to value at 26%. They're very close to having 2,000 lenders. Uh, we saw three new loans on the platform this week to a total of 27 up from 24 last week. We still have one single default and three overdue loans and 11,000 pounds of interest currently being serviced by the provision fund, which has about 40K in it. Nothing's really changed. Uh, I did see a new loan this week, so I thought it'd be good to kind of go through an example of the types of loans that the loan pad gets involved in an office to lenders. Uh, so Southeast One in London, the newest loan that they added on August 6th was a development of seven boutique apartments. And six of those have actually been completed. One of them is being close to completion. And there is 3,270 square feet of commercial space and common area. It's a 7.2 million pounds gross development value 6.52 million on a 90 day sale amount what that means is when we say gross development value at 7.2 million that would be complete retail in a normal market a 90 day sale valuation means if they were trying to rush to get rid of that security or that property within 90 days then it would be valued at about um, 6.52 million the total loan amount on it is 4.6 million pounds with Hanf Capital Loan Pad Sole Borrower taking a 3.65 million stake and Loan Pad taking a 1 million pound stake. So if you look at the loan to values on that loan based on the GDV gross development value, you're only talking about Loan Pad at 13.8% loan to value on the standard gross development development value and only 15.3% uh, on a 90 day value. Uh, the loans being written at 6.25% interest. So, I mean, generally it looks like a, a, a very solid loan and the way the loan pad positions itself is just like that. They take a very low stake in it. They're in first position, even before Hanf, which is really a great place to be. I mean, Hanf's putting in 3.65 million of their own cash. That's a family lending business. And then Loan Pad is only putting in a million, but they get the first position even in front of Loan Pad. So uh, you can see Loan Pad's risk is extremely low on a loan like that. So yeah, I was happy. I thought that was a, a solid loan. I don't always go through all of the loan documents just to see what they are, but that one struck me because it, it had quite a large valuation of 7.2 million. So I wanted to see what kind of loans that um, Loan Pad were, were underwriting this month from Hanf. So yeah, it was cool. I like that loan. Um, I also, I went on to Google Maps and just looked at the area and it's, it, there was nothing there on the Google Maps probably because it was a picture that was taken a while ago. So you can't always take that as an accurate picture of what's going on in the development. But you could see the to the land area. It was in a busy, busy street in London, south of the Thames. Uh, I noticed that uh, a funding circle share prices went up this week to, to 96p, and I started scratching my head thinking, who the hell is buying these funding circle shares? I mean, I have no idea. They have a market cap of about 385 million pounds. I mean, somebody's buying them. Maybe people are trading them. But they're not very volatile, so usually traders want to trade Stocks like um, that are really moving up and down a lot, like Kodak has been over the last week. But yeah, the FC funding circle share price bumped up a uh, you know 10p or whatever it was from last week. 
property partner they sent out an update this week they i have not gotten any dividends from them since february 2020 and they're saying dividends will be suspended or, until the 30th of, Sep of september 2020 what's happening is the dividends are actually being put into the property accounts to bolster the financial position of each property because they are dealing with vacancies right now um see so as you, if you're not an investor in property partner what they do is they take out mortgages on behalf of lenders to leverage the portfolio and if you look at my review i list that as one of the sort of cons of of property partner that there is that extra risk involved if property partner for some reason didn't pay those mortgages then um there would be some severe issues so i'm not a big fan of the whole mortgage situation but that's just what you get when you invest in property partner or through them and buy their property shares. It didn't used to be like that. So hoping after, after September or October, we'll start to see some of those dividends being paid out because uh, yeah, it's been since February. So they have a um, bank's mortgage deferrals on all of their properties for six months. And they are going to be commencing Property Partners' five-year anniversaries on in October. What that means is after five years of ownerships, the properties come up for vote and investors who own the shares decide whether they want to hang on to those properties or put them up for sale. Um, so Property Partners said that 30% rent was in arrears in May and that's been reduced to 23% in July, so it has come down a little bit. Student accommodations remain only at 45% occupation. But I would expect that to start to rise when students return back to university at some point. Uh, I don't know when that's happening, but I don't foresee it to be too far away. Uh, the other news, so we saw this week, the Neil Woodford investors or in the news article, it said savers. I don't know why they would be savers or investors, but they're saying savers in the closed Woodford equity income fund have lost more than a quarter of their money, which equates to one whole billion pounds. It's a huge amount of money. So, uh, yes, yeah, savers or investors have lost more than a billion pounds since it was the fund was frozen by its administrators, Link Fund Solutions. An investigation has found a series of failings, meaning that 300,000 pounds of, of investors' money is trapped in the fund, and there could be a second scandal over mismanagement of this money. Um, investors have lost out on tens of millions of pounds because of the fire sale of assets by Link Fund Solutions, who is the administrator, as it tried to quickly wind down the fund. So uh, basically, the administrator has royally screwed up. They've tried to um, quick, quickly so they could pay investors back. Problem with that is, you know, what, what was Link doing in the background? You know, we don't know what type of shady stuff has gone on with liquidations that were fire sales and now have resulted in 300,000 pounds of, uh, sorry, 300,000 investors that are trapped inside the fund because they can't get their money back. So, um, yeah, this is this is the reason why I always preach index track is, uh, you know, who'd have thought that Neil Woodford would screw up the fund the way he has. He was the darling investor of, UK for a long time and uh, just goes to show you how things can change and this is why I preach index trackers index trackers you don't want to put your investment in the hands of an active fund manager because he can cock it up you know and if you were to lose a quarter of your investment I mean there's investors out there that have I would imagine pretty huge amounts of money inside the Woodford fund because those funds were sold by financial advisors all over the country as being a safe place to put money along with other, you know, managed active funds like Invesco. Not saying anything bad about those particular funds. I'm just saying the Woodford fund was put inside of that 
bucket of what would be considered okay to invest through by financial advisors giving their advice to clients. And, you know, there is risk. Like, you know, we talk about risk involved in peer-to-peer -peer funding. We're upset about what's happened with lending and funding secure. But you can see, even if you invest in a managed unit trust, like something as big as Woodford Fund, which is huge, it was a massive fund, uh, you are you are open to risk um, of loss. And, and people in the Woodford Fund are going to get losses, whether or not it'll be investigated by the FCA and investors will be con compensated somehow. I don't know. But again, this is another reason why you really want to look at your investment portfolio and see what the hell your financial advisor has put you in. Now, th this, this Woodford Fund situation is really going to scar the investment sector. Uh, it's going to give it a bad rap. So, and it also is just another thumbs up for index trackers that you don't have somebody trying to pick out the next great stock. So rant over on that. If anybody has any of that Woodford fund, put it in the chat. I'd be interested to know, you know, what information you've received about your investment. I know somebody's got to have some of that fund because it was so popular. Uh, and this week I'm going to do a little platform wrap up on unbolted. It's kind of on, you know, it's, it's one of those companies I, I really think is doing okay right now just because of the environment and, and they were doing good before COVID, but that's that porn type of lending. Um, so what are my, my pros and cons for unbolted? You can get up to returns of 12%. I haven't been seeing returns that high because too i've been staying away from the riskier loans that pay higher amounts and sticking to mainly the gold jewelry style loans excuse me just once i i don't know why my nose is itching so much um you can do you can set auto lend which is a which is a positive hands off no investment time management needed problem with auto lend you're going to see that there's some cash drag at the moment because there's more investor supply than there is loan demand. Uh, another pro, another thumbs up is you have porn style loans, which are backed by secured assets hold, held by unbolted like gold and silver. They have pretty conservative asset value, asset valuations. They've got a really good default recovery as they're able to take things like gold and jewelry, that default and sell them at auction for a really fast disposal, not like property back loans, which can take forever. Uh, though they have a 1% provision trust provision fund, which is paid by uh, company fees and it covers potential, potential default losses on, in, on uh, capital, not interest. And the gold trust that they also have covers potential drops in gold prices. What you're seeing with gold right now, because it's so high, the loans that Unbolted have taken out you know, in the past few months have really those assets really risen in value because gold is now over $2,000 an ounce. So that's, that's one benefit uh, to holding an asset like gold. Obviously it could go completely the other way and gold could have dropped a lot and those now assets become worth less, but you're seeing the positive upside of gold and how that could affect unbolted in a positive way. So what are the, the uh, thumbs down. I was going to use the word cons, and I remember somebody said don't use the word con because it's, you know, it's pretty negative. So we'll do thumbs down. What's the thumbs down for unbolted? Well, you got borrowers paying up to 43% APR a year on loans. Now some would say, well, is that really ethical lending? Does that go in the same um, stable as? A credit card lending, which I'm not a fan of. I think credit card companies are complete monsters and, you know, people just, they get stuck in those loans and they can't get out. So that's, that's definitely a thumbs down if you're into ethical lending, 43% interest rate on loans, very high. Uh, Unbolt is a small company, so you've got risk in that respect. Uh, they also don't have high expenses that other co these larger companies like Race Center and Funding Circle have. So that, that could be considered a pro also. Thumbs up. Uh, again, one of the negatives, thumbs down, is you're going to have some probably cash drag as 
demand for the loans gets higher. Um, a lot of loans on unbolted are smaller in nature, it's in the few thousand pound range. So um, you're going to get some cash drag. I, I withdrew some money today that had been sitting there for a couple of weeks and just hadn't been really reinvested. So I just took it out. So if you have a large account balance, you're probably going to have a hard time getting your money invested. So it's good for people that are wanting to invest small amounts of money, but probably not big. Um, there's very little asset information on the loans. They don't, e don't even include a photo of what they're lending against. There's no secondary market for exiting loans other than capital business loans, which personally I don't buy. I haven't seen any of those loans on their secondary market up for sale. That's all based on demand and supply. The website's very basic. It really lacks functionality. And there's no statistics information or frequently asked questions. And there's no information the last time I checked on what happens if the company fails, what is their wind-up procedure. So um, there, there's definitely some, some thumbs up and thumbs down for Unbolted because you are going to get you know, that higher return rate. So you do have the risk level there. I would definitely say if you're going to invest in Unbolted, to do it in a diverse manner. So you're not putting too much into the, to that company or, or any other company and uh, go from there. Okay. So last but not least, my five biggest alt fi investment re regrets. These are the investments when I think about that I made that I wish I could just rewind time and, you know, redo them at the very least. You know, some of them I wish I'd never done, period. Um, they were very early on in my peer-to-peer -peer lending investment journey, probably within year one. I would say I'm in year five right now. Uh, some of them within the first six months. But of course, number one topping the list is the Landy company. Um, let's see, you know what's going on with them. They just made a complete disaster of, of a company and of their lending and loan book and pulled some very questionable tactics that is being uncovered by the administrators, possible fraud involved, uh, changes to terms and conditions to benefit them in some ways, just, just really crappy stuff. You know, when I think about Lendy, I think about eating a really nasty food that I would never put in my mouth anymore, like eel or, or live octopus, slimy and gross. Second on that list would uh, definitely be collateral. Um, for those that don't know, collateral was supposed to be operating under an FCA regulation, which they turned out they were not, and they got shut down. Uh, that administration process has been dragging on forever with no end in sight and investors not knowing where they stand as far as how much money they will be getting back, if anything. So I would definitely reverse that one completely and have never entered into collateral. Third, I would say on the list is money thing. Um, yeah, mixed feelings about money thing. Uh, some of the early loans were good. Some of the later loans have turned out to be really bad. Uh, the good thing about them is they didn't go into administration. question is whether they'll be able to handle that loan book in a efficient manner and whether people will get paid back. But uh, looking back, you know, I did, I did make a good amount of interest from money things, so I can't really hate on them as much as, say, lending and collateral. But uh, looking back, it's probably chasing those high 12% returns. Not a good idea. Looking back, fourth on my list, you'll be surprised, is is funding secure? Um, question whether I should put them at number three, but, you know, funding secure, I've gotten some money back out of the loans that went into administration, so I'm um, not quite as salty about funding secure, but that's, a, again, definitely a company I would have rewound time, never invested. Um, and then fifth on the list, now, this is a tricky one because, uh, it, it's actually Property Moose, and Property Moose sort of did the right thing as what they saw was the right thing to do for investors. And Property Moose is one of those companies that offered shares in buy-to-lets, 
And, you know, people could technically get an ownership of a, a buy to let and then receive rental income. Problem was that property moves soon realized that they just weren't able to make that business profitable and they pulled the plug. And what they did is they moved all of the properties into one sort of a, a managed fund and they gave investors an uh, you know, option to exit out of their investment. But the problem was the exit was going to be at a loss. And some people decided to take the loss and get out. I decided to stay in, uh, partly because I'd met with the owner, Andrew Gardner, several times. And I did have some faith that, you know, from our sit downs, that what the direction of where they were going to take property moose was going to be one that would be okay in the long run. Um, my biggest concern now being involved in this fund is absolute lack of liquidity. There's, there's no way to exit. Um, you know, looking back, I think I would, the smart thing to do would have been to exit half of it at a loss and then just leave the other half. But I didn't do that. And they were talking about a stock market float at some point and being able to provide liquidity, but you know, who knows how long that's going to take. The good news is the property portfolio is performing rather well. Um, but we haven't gotten any money back and nothing has been paid out. So, you know, I don't know where that stands right now. And that's prob that's number five on my list of alt fi investment regrets that looking back, if I had you know, future vision from the crystal ball, I definitely would have looked at that investment and said, eh, not for me. And that's one reason why I tend to stay away from these other investments now that involve buying shares and buy to lets because, uh, yeah, just sort of a bad taste in the mouth from what's happened with property moose and um, how that money will, will be paid out is very questionable. So there's that. And last bit of news, there was a, really interesting Hargreaves Lansdowne survey that showed two in five people would never invest in stocks, but 30% of them would invest in property. Um, the survey said the stock market comes a distant second because people are worried about the risks involved. This tends to be because they overestimate the risk of stocks losing value over the long term, and they underestimate the risk involved in property. They also forget the risk that inflation will eat their cash away in their savings accounts. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And even in you know today's world of 2020, we have access to all these trading apps now, which makes stock ownership very easy. You can even buy pieces of stocks now. If you don't have the 2,200 pounds to pony up for Amazon, you can buy 10 pounds worth, whatever the minimum of the trading platform is, and buy 10 pounds worth of Amazon stock. And I was really surprised that two out of five people said they would never invest in stocks. That uh, was really uh, mind blowing. I would not thought that it would be that high, you know, in 2020, just because the accessibility of information now. And, and, you know, you can see that the stock market has generally rebounded very well from COVID so far. I don't think this is really inaccurate picture of what the stock market will do long term i would not be surprised at all if we see another major downturn because we still haven't seen the economic fallout of covid yet but uh i was really surprised about that survey so i thought it was an interesting piece of news i think the dow's what close to over twenty seven thousand today 27,357. So, I mean, we're getting close to that 28,000 point. Um, it's very interesting. By the way, if you haven't heard, Apple is going to be doing a stock split three, uh, four to one. So if you own one Apple stock on August 24th, you're going to get three, but the price will also um, be reduced by 75%. So if Apple is $400 US, it will split and then it will be revalued at uh, $100. Not really sure why Apple is doing that. It's probably just purely a mental thing for people who are looking at the stock price going, oh, it's $400, I can't afford that. 
even though, again, you can buy fractional ownership now of Apple stock. But uh, I think it's uh, purely a mindset thing for investors to look at Apple stock and go, wow, it's only $100. It's now affordable. And, you know, Apple did a a stock split several years ago. I think it was seven to one when the stock was, I think, seven or 800 US dollars per stock. And now it's, it went back down to a hundred and it was repriced at a hundred. Now we're looking at close to 430. So Apple's been performing uh, very well. So it could be a good opportunity to pick up some, some Apple stock, see where it goes from there. So that's the news this week. We did, oh, we're under, we're under now. Um, we're under an hour. Let me read through the comments. See if you have anything that is you need answering. Uh, let's see. I always like reading through your comments. Annabelle says she's staying with friends who first got me into rate setter and lending works two years ago. Are they still your friends because of that? Hi, Derek in Connecticut. Nice to see you. Paul says, do I think that the rate setter investors funds will be more or less secure with this tie up with Metro bank? Um, one would have to think secure, more secure. Uh, The only risk you have really is if Metro Bank goes belly up. They've done some really funny things in the past. Metro Bank is definitely not the sanest bank in the world. They've had some pretty bad losses. I think they had a scandal. Um, But they're bringing investment money into rate sets, which should be a good thing for investors. I think, you know, my general plan for rate setter is going to be to exit at this point and the the, you know the amount of money that an interest that we're being paid now is so low it's really not worth the risk so once the rates normalize maybe go up a little bit more i'd probably consider investing again but not now brian said funding circles IPO and their shares was hugely overvalued. Yeah, I totally agree. Oh, Paul says, don't forget my disclaimer. Yeah, I've been forgetting to do that. Okay, just don't listen to me. My This is not financial advice. This is all opinion-based. Make your own decisions. Do your own research. If you need to consult a financial professional, do so. And don't invest more money you can afford to lose. And remember that bits of bill lending investments are not FSCS protected like savings accounts are. Okay, there's the disclaimer. Mike says 90 days in a normal market for a for a GDV gross develop, gross development value. It's important to note this is not a distress sale by receivers and administrators. Absolutely, totally agree important distinction to make that 90 day gross development value on uh, loans are under normal market conditions in a non-distressed state. So those properties can be sold for considerably less during an administration liquidation. Oh gosh. Yeah, if you talk about my plant, it's definitely plastic. It's always it leans over that way. It's uh, it's it's fake. I've had that plant for a long time. I'm a plant killer, chica boy. I can never keep one alive, so I have to go fake. So Gary says on the plus side with property partner, I've had no problem selling on the secondary market and withdrawing the cash from the platform. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you you want to take a loss and and get out. A lot of the the properties are being sold at discounts, so I'm just going to hang in there and stick in it. Irving Stroll, welcome Irving, nice to see you. His advice is to stay far away from the two 
percent and twenty percent brigade. He is referring to financial advisors who take a two percent fee. Yeah, I don't think we need financial advisors at this point in our lives, but there you go. So everybody's different. Paul says, assets, capital, how are they? And funding circle. Um, funding circle, I would not invest a penny with. Uh, I think you'll see funding circle exit out of retail peer-to-peer -peer lending at some point as long as they're doing these CBILS loans and start to go institutional. But I have no interest in investing in funding circle at this point. I think you'll see that your returns are a lot less than what they uh, target. And it's just not really a great investment. Uh, assets, I think, has been doing okay. They're transparent. Um, I expect them to continue to be one of the more solid peer-to-peer -peer companies in the future. Good communication there. Oh, um, by the way, I, I totally miss this, but Assets Capital is going to be launching their new a access account trading marketplace. I, I would imagine within a week we'll see that. Um, right now, you cannot sell loans from access accounts but you will be able to sell your loans at a discount. So if you need to get out quickly, for some reason, you have the option to do that. I think that's a good thing. Any Anything that adds to liquidity through assets capital, because right now exiting is very slow, I think is a good thing. Paul says, itchy nose, new COVID symptom. No, don't say that. I don't, Chica Boy, I don't have a problem with my nose. It's just itching. It's not like I'm not digging up inside of it. There's nothing going. There's nothing going on. You've done a thumbs down for me, Aki Chat. That might be the first thing, the first time. Steven says, What do I mean by cons? Uh, pros and cons. So, a pro is a thumbs up, a con would be a thumbs down. Maybe that's a word that I picked up when I was in America. Maybe that's not something they use in England. So, thumbs up, thumbs down. Pros and cons. John says, unbolted gold, gold loans do give the weight in gold. Yes, they do provide that information. I would just, for some reason, I want to see a picture of what it is. I don't know. I come from a jeweler's background, son of a jeweler, so I like to see it. I want to know it's there. Cheeky Boy says his biggest regret was investing in funding secure. Absolutely. Yeah, Aki, just to clarify, I don't put unbolted generally as a thumbs down. I just say they have some thumbs up and thumbs down points that we have to look at when we're looking at risk and reward. Mike Powell says, Patton here, all 12% platforms too good to be true. I definitely am make the 12% platforms uh, a very, very small part of my my investing portfolio now at this point. Um, I, could, I could absolutely see exiting out of companies like Able Rate and just having a little bit of money in them unbolted. I just, yeah, there's definitely been a pattern of, of poor results from those lending companies but unbolted i could see being okay because you know it is pawn shop stuff and they are really racking up their interest rates that they're charging borrowers which i can't say i really love but we'll see there's a lot to learn Uh, Paul, yeah, I just did my assets capital update. Again, the marketplace will go live soon for their access account for you to be able to liquidate and resell, but we don't have any any other real at, uh, updates. Funding circle appears to just be doing a lot of CBILS lending, which peer-to-peer -peer lenders cannot loan on. So 
I think you're going to see a very stagnant funding circle. Uh, I just barely have any money left in, in funding circle. I exited many, many months ago. And no news has really been out there about funding circle, so we don't know too much. So Mike says, property moves this month's update suggests news on the listing shortly. Yeah, I would like to... I would like to know, you know, with property miss when there's going to be some kind of a dividend payout. What's going on with that? Chica boy, you're you're so full of of uh, compliments. You're you're going to make my girlfriend jealous. She's getting jealous of you. So Gary, you're also in Property Moose. Yeah, you must have been one of the early adopters too. I don't know how many investors they have, but I, I know it, was, it wasn't a large percent of people that exited out of Property Moose when they changed their business model. But we'll see. Oh, yes. Uh, I did forget about Propland. So Propland, there was a new story about them having seven loans that are past due. And here's me saying that Propland, I thought, was a solid company. And I, I still I still think that they're, they're solid. Um, seven loans past due in their 51 loan portfolio, four in default. I don't think they were very quick to t let people what was going on let people know what was going on with those. Um, so it was a delay. Propland is commercial bridging and commercial mortgages. Uh, but they say everybody, as far as their borrowers, made payments in July and 100% of interest was collected and paid to lenders. So four loans in default. I mean, dealing with commercial property at the moment is probably going to see some defaults just because of the nature of what's going on with the pandemic is going to have a negative economic effect on commercial property. Not too surprised. Like to see that number of seven loans passed you a little bit less. Five, I think would be acceptable. I mean, it's not great, but 10% of the loan book. If I missed anything else off my news list. Uh, let's see. Any news from Assets Capital? No, like I said, Brian, nothing really new other than their release of their, their market place for access accounts will be probably in the next week. Annabelle's friend is sold on peer-to-peer -peer despite the recent wobbles. Hmm, interesting. Alan says, I'd exit from Rate Setter if I could transfer to Octopus Choice. Any news on when they'll reopen? No, there's uh, still no news on Octopus Choice, what's going on with them. I Again, I withdrew some money out because it was just sitting there doing nothing. So I don't have any news on Octopus and when they're going to reopen. Martin says, if Rate Setter and Funding Circle fade away as peer-to-peer -peer lenders, does our money fade away too? I hope not. I hope you'll get paid back. I mean, from what I've been told by people that are invested in Funding Circle, obviously there's some default issues going on there and people are not receiving their target return rates. But, um, you know, I don't know what the answer to that is. I, I would hope that Funding Circle will not fade away with your money or rate setter. Uh, I'm pretty close to, to getting out of the five-year market. It's been moving a lot. Let's see, I, I've gone up 500 Q spaces in the last 13 days, but on the five-year account, access only eight spaces in the last two weeks. So there must be a really big access account ahead that's preventing real movement. But uh, yeah, I don't think uh, 
I don't think rate setter is going to fade away with your money. Cheeky boy, I'm definitely not a financial advisor. You're going to get me into trouble. Is the new rate setter account under Metro now covered by FCS protection, FSCS protection? I would say no. Anything peer-to-peer -peer lending will not be covered under that, but any money in your holding account will be under protection. I don't expect that will change at all. Because it, you know, whenever you invest in peer-to-peer -peer lending, it is an investment, so it's not going to be covered by FSCS. Oh, pros and cons is an English phrase. Okay, Terry, what are you says? What are my thoughts on lending works? Um, disappointed to see that the shield is not more padded than it than it should be so i you know if it was a close to a million pounds now down to about five hundred and twenty thousand on the last report that means obviously they're saying, seeing some issues i mean you talk about unsecured lending obviously those are going to be the first people that get hurt when they lose jobs at, during an economic downturn a uh, good thing is that Lending Works was purchased by an investment capital company, so there is going to be some some financial stability. I'm not sure that I truly feel really comfortable about continuing to put more money in right now. I'm just withdrawing interest, capital repayments. I'd like to see, you know, what happens over the next six months. Again, I don't really see there's any point in taking unnecessary risks now at this point. Uh, LendingWorks is one of those companies that I'm keeping a watchful eye on. There, there really hasn't been a lot of news, but they're saying that they're going to restart paying interest. Uh, when was it? November? Okay, yeah, the end of October 2020. So once they start to you know start repaying, um, interest would be nice to see. And maybe feel a little bit more comfortable about them, but definitely not on top of my list and not on my top five anymore. John says our unbolted gold loans loan to value eighty percent based on the current daily gold price. If so, then will not current gold loans be especially liable to default in a year's time? Well, they'll value them when they. Yes, yeah, so it will be on the spot gold price valuation whenever they take the asset and do the paperwork on the loan. Um, I don't know that they would be liable. It definitely, there is some increased risk when a gold price is very high because you are you're obviously valuing on the highest price of gold, but I don't think the risk is too increased. A lot of those gold loans too, they don't, they, they don't, um, they're not long loans. Sometimes people will redeem them within a month or two. Gary says he likes the regular updates from Able Rate. Seems generally well run. Yeah, I think I like David Bradley Ward. He puts out updates. And, but again, you know, when you're, Getting 12% interest, you've got to know that it's high risk. So, But I do like the communication. Annabelle says, presume we can't do anything to get money out of rate sets. So, well, you can, and you can put in your exit request, request and uh, get in the queue. Or you, And also, you know, you can set five-year, three-year, and one-year accounts to have the money go back into your holding account, or you can do my little rate set to hack to stop your money being relent in plus and max. If you watch the video on my website or on the YouTube channel, you can see how to do that. It's very easy. You set your own rates, put them high, and that way your money won't get relent. Thank you, McMahon video. I, I don't think I'm the man. I am a man, but just, just a man like you. Maybe if you're a man, if you're not just a person like you. 
Uh, McMahon video says, with regards to rates that I've taken 85% of my access money out just by setting my reinvestment rate high and withdrawing my money from the market. Yep, that's the hack. It's a good way to do it. Neil says, what happens to peer-to-peer -peer lending rates if savings rates go negative? Hmm. Well, I don't really think that you're going to see that much of a change in peer-to-peer I mean, if saving rates went negative, they're already very low right now. So you might see a small movement in the peer-to-peer -peer lending rates, but that's probably not just purely due to the negative savings rates, but more down to competition within the peer-to-peer -peer lending sector. I mean, you have a lot of peer-to-peer -peer lend lending companies that are fighting after the same loans. So obviously there's going to be competition for quality loans. If a, if a borrower is a quality borrower, he's going to go for the lowest loan rate that he can. So he's probably going to shop around peer-to-peer -peer lending companies. But it may have a small effect on peer-to-peer -peer lending rates. You, you're definitely not going to see the best returns right now during COVID. I mean, you've seen it with rate setter halving their interest returns and lending works reducing, Zopa reducing, funding circle not meeting their targets. Don't worry about it, Chico. We all, we all know. We all know what you meant. McMahon video says, sad for rate set to solid crew versus most amateur platforms. Yes, it, it's it's kind of sad. I, I like the rate set of people. I've always had a good relationship with them. But you know, at the end of the day, if the interest rate returns are just not attractive, then I don't care You know how good the platform is um versus the risk i always have to say that because you know i am invested in some low paying peer-to-peer -peer lending companies but as as risk goes you know rate setters they got they got a pretty big monthly obligation to meet with their expenses with their staff levels it's a big company they've got about 740 million pounds under management so there is some risk involved there Returns have to match the risk in some ways. McMahon video says, peer-to-peer -peer is sadly done now. I don't know that I agree with that. I think that there are actually some decent peer-to-peer um, -peer lending companies out there. And as, as savings rates continue to drop, uh, you're going to have to look for places to get yield. And I think there are some good peer-to-peer -peer companies that are going to be able to provide you with an opportunity to get yield from bit to bit. But like you say, yes, net niche platforms, not necessarily for high net worth. I mean, there are some, some companies. I like the ones on my top five for now that can always change on a daily basis. But I think bit to bit, you're going to see it consolidate and you'll see less companies, um, maybe some mergers, maybe more acquisitions. And I think actually what you'll see is peer-to-peer -peer being run in a more efficient and better manner. But there are a lot of people that have bad taste in their mouth from what's happened from lending and funding secure and collateral. So there's that. But we're also, you know, we're, we're pretty early adopters, even if you think the peer-to-peer -peer was really only started in what mid to late 2000s. We're still in the early adoption phase. Just like Bitcoin, by the way, if you haven't seen what's going on with Bitcoin, it's shot up quite a lot recently. Again, early adoption phase, it's not too late. You're in the very early adoption phase of, of crypto coin and Bitcoin. By the way, this week I've recorded two new videos. One, how to use Coinbase to buy Bitcoins for the lowest fee or, or any type of crypto using Coinbase Pro, which has a much lower fee than the regular Coinbase platform. I'll be releasing that video uh, probably next week. I'm actually going to take a little, a few days holiday this week for the first time in a, in a long time. So I've recorded that video. It's a complete walkthrough of how to buy uh, cryptocurrency through Coinbase Pro's trading platform. And also a video on how to buy Vanguard's index trackers. So if you've thought about dipping your toe into Vanguard, you better watch that video and see exactly how 
to purchase index trackers and which ones I prefer to pick. So again, I'll probably put those videos out next week. Nice to see you, Derek. Thanks for joining us. Go charge up your iPad. Uh, Paul News says Bitcoin still think it's worth a bet. Absolutely, 100% agree. Bitcoin, massive reward versus the risk that you're taking for a future upswing of who knows how much. Um, I definitely bang a couple of grand into Bitcoin and let it sit, if nothing else. It's possibilities of Bitcoin definitely rising over 100k us up to who knows millions so you were very early in bitcoin's adoption very very early still plenty of time to get in there and as an early adopter you know you can't look at bitcoin and say well i could have gotten in in 2010 for 75p you just have to look at it now and still say yes you're still an early adopter, even though it doesn't seem like it because Bitcoin's approaching 12,000 a US a coin, but it's still very, very early. Peter says assets, capital froze repayments on their access accounts on Monday pending the launch of their secondary market for access account. Yeah, I know. I'm disappointed too, Peter. I totally share. Uh, Peter says, I'm worried that when it's launched, we'll be only be able to get out by selling at a discount. Yeah, that that's the, unfortunately the bad thing about using discounts in secondary markets. Uh, on the one hand, they do increase liquidity and they provide a way for somebody that really needs to get out quickly for an emergency or if they're willing to take a haircut that they can hopefully do that. But the problem is for people that don't want to take a heck on the loss, they provide massive competition that there will always be people selling at a discount, which kind of forces you to have to sell at a discount. Also presents opportunities on the buying side. Somebody's offering a 2% discount. That means you can pick up 100 pounds of loans for only uh, 98 pounds. So there is some value there. And you may be able to pick up some at eight, nine, I don't know, nine percent. So uh, but yeah, I, I expect, I don't know if, um, I don't know, John, if 2% will do the job to get out. Um, I doubt it for some reason. I think you'd probably be looking three to five, but we'll see. Stephen Green says, what is Vanguard's index tracker level at the moment? Uh, last time I checked, it was 545 pounds for the the US equity tracker it's gone up it's gone up a lot uh hang on let me let me take a look you might want to check out this this article on my website I've just updated it this week it's which trackers do I buy and why I've been updating it a little bit more to also include Fidelity because if you're interested in buying a world tracker, Fidelity has a, I believe, a better one than Vanguard. It's more diversified. So July 22nd price on Vanguard's US equity tracker was 557 pounds and 83 pence. And its launch price 11 years ago so that date was 100 pounds. You can see it's, uh, what, what would you say, five-fold, five-back, four-back? It's gone up a lot. It's gone up 400 pounds, 400 and 457 pounds per share from 2009. Uh, also, if you do like those trackers, you can buy them in income and accumulation version. So accumulation version is a dividend reinvestment where all the dividends go back into the fund. And what you'll see is a, an income version, which pays uh, about 1.4% in yield per, per year. So you can get some income out of a an index tracker too. It's not going to be one of the high, highest yielding because obviously you have 
lot of stocks on there that don't really target dividends. That's not what they are there for, but there are some in there that pay dividends. So you can get income, but what you'll see is the income share price class is going to be lower than the uh, accumulation share price. I think the income is 465 pounds ish, whereas the growth price is 557 pounds per share. So that's the difference. But if you're in retirement, you want to get some income and you want a tracker, you can use the income version. So Mike says, Bitcoin, impact of regulators getting involved, Bank of England, FCA getting itchy feet, I feel. Um, yeah, there, there's always that risk. There is always the risk. The beautiful thing about Bitcoin, it's a world coin that just because Bank of England or regulators make concessions or rules or regulations, um, there's always ways to buy it and they can't really control the price of Bitcoin. There's no way for them to control it. So I don't think that I have any worries at all about any government doing anything to mess with Bitcoin. Now, the, the one thing that they could do is stop you from buying it by banging, uh, banning payment processes and say, you cannot buy Bitcoin through any of these payment processes, which they did to online poker in the U.S., essentially made it a real problem but yeah if your government does that then you got to vote for other other government people because you know they're really infringing on people's rights to choose you know, if i want to buy bitcoin i should be allowed to buy bitcoin you know there's there's no reason for a government to be regulating something that was created not to be regulated Alan says procure procure ETF trust to procure space ETF as a tracker for companies taking 80% minimum from the space industry, which is currently in pounds, but projected to be trillions in 20 years. The ticker is UFO, another sleeper like Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, it's that, it's, I'd have to look more into it. It sounds really interesting. You know, I think the one problem with trackers like that that is so targeted towards a specific sector is let's say you had um the space industry has kind of been subdued for the last decade since the u.s stopped sending up the space shuttles they had the the problems with the shuttles exploding and i think if there was an accident like that it could really affect the space industry so it, it is very speculative but you would think that space has got a lot a lot of a lot of growth in it. I don't know. I wouldn't put my life savings into a space e ETF, even though the tick is called cool. UFO, right? Peter says the trouble with a three and a half, three to five percent discount in assets capital is it completely wipes out any interest I may have earned. Yeah, that's the reason I'm not. I'm not exiting. And plus, if you believe in assets as a business, then stick it out if you don't then you take your you take your uh wipe out of interest and say you know i got out with all of my capital intact which is a score in a terrible economic environment hi chris nice to see you you can catch up on the stream when it gets archived Alex says he loves my idea of voting for another government if they ban Bitcoin. If they ban Bitcoin, uh, you're gonna you think that the protests over the police brutality was was bad. You're gonna see some some crazy protests going on about any type of regulation with Bitcoin. So I would be outside the Houses of Parliament with my little sign. I mean, government. The government officials tend to stink everything up, and they have to get their their fingers involved, probably for financial benefit. At the end of the day, we'll, we'll see. 
Mike says Bitcoin promotion regulations already consulting on whether it can be promoted. Volatility induces risk. Can your average Joe assess that? I assume is the question. Yeah, but can can your average Joe assess anything? I mean, he certainly can't assess most peer to peer loans. He can't assess which stocks to pick. He can't assess probably most of his unit trust that his financial advisor has told him what to buy, even though, yes, financial advisor is regulated. Um, I mean, I, I agree that the consumer should be protected to some degree, but I think you have to give people choice. Um, Bitcoin is not... Bitcoin, in my opinion, is not a shitty financial product like a mini bond. Because, yes, it is speculative, but there's a lot of fundamentals behind it that make it make sense. So, yeah, and I, th Mike, I think that you'll find the population really does care about, uh, Bitcoin, what, what you're seeing is the younger generation that grew up on the internet. They are, they've done surveys that says that, you know, those younger generation are actually buying Bitcoin and they would rather invest in Bitcoin than gold, which says they put their trust in future technology more than they do in gold prices. And the stock market. So yeah, I think they do care. I think the older generation probably doesn't give two hoots about Bitcoin. But we're talking about the future generation even. You know, I would consider myself a little bit on the on the older side to be really interested in Bitcoin, but I happen to take an interest in it at, at 47 years old. But, um, you know, look, regulation is, is tricky because if you over-regulate, then it's controlling. And if you under-regulate, you do leave people like Mr. Joe susceptible to buying something that he doesn't really understand. <laughs> Chica boy, sometimes I do say words that are worse than shitty. I'll be honest. Um, yeah. I would say Bitcoin has, has some real legs and uh, I, I would hate to see any government trying to overregulate it because Bitcoin was supposed to be an unregulated thing and it wasn't very accessible before. Now it's a lot more accessible. So promotion regulations, oh God, I don't know. Kind of makes me a little bit sick about it. Alex says, what, what do I think stops a wide adoption of Bitcoin or at least stable coins? Um, I think a lot of people don't really know how, first of all, to use it. Um, it's considered highly volatile, so it's not really good for, say, buying something of value. Well, you know, there's, there's stories about people selling their houses for Bitcoin, but it's risky because if your Bitcoin drops 20 or 30% over a period of a couple of days, then obviously something you're selling is a problem. But I think that is completely temporary and that you'll start to see Bitcoin flatten out as a more stable form of financial coin. It's going to take a while. You're getting to the end of the circulation of the 21 million Bitcoins that will be finalized in circulation. There will not be any more than that. And I think when that, once that happens, uh, maybe not even at the 21 million point because we've still got quite a number of decades to go before that happens. But I think once it starts to mature, um, you're going to see Bitcoin really stabilize and become more adopted. Some of the other deregulated coins too are, are of interest like Chainlink. I'm not going to get too much into those, but uh, I probably didn't use the right words, not deregulated, but the the name is is really slipping my mind. Anyway, yes, I am still talking. Anyway, we've been an hour and 20 minutes, way too long. I'm going to wrap up this week's live stream. Uh, 
thank you everybody for visiting again really appreciate it. it's nice to see everybody and uh, next week hopefully all being well i don't catch the coronavirus i'll be here at 7 30 p.m uk time to give you lots of other useful and maybe useless information we'll see have a great night and we'll see you next time take care